And I'd like to welcome Dean Scottress and Charlie Summers up to the stage. They can choose wherever they wish to sit. I, I think, by uh, virtue of precedent, will sit in the middle. <laughs> Charlie, welcome back. It's been wonderful to see you. Uh, for those of you who know, again, I do work at Channel 13. I uh, tend to moderate debates. Uh, I often try to agree to do these sorts of things because, uh, one, I live in Scarborough, so I tend to say yes to sitting. Uh, issues that, that are in Scarborough. In fact, I think my sons are playing t-ball and, and base, double A baseball somewhere within about a couple hundred yards of us right now. Uh, the game hasn't wrapped up. Um, so big thanks to my wife for letting me come here instead. Um, I want to say a couple of quick words about the, uh, the format again. This is a, a debate that was uh, organized by the Cumberland County Committee, uh, not by myself. Uh, the questions and the rules were established by then. I made it clear to them, I said, hey, look, I've got to do a debate with these two guys a week from today, so I want to sort of keep my, uh, our debate rules sort of separate from your debate rules, and we'll keep it, uh, keep it straightforward that way. Uh, there'll be no opening statements in this particular debate. Questions will be formatted, for the most part, as if they were asked by the opposition party. Again, this was the, uh, the format that was devised by the committee, uh, and of course, as a moderator, uh, I will abide by the format that they've requested. Uh, each candidate will have three minutes to answer, up to three minutes to answer. There will be a rebuttal period of up to a minute to talk. And in fact, what you may find, and this will be limited by the fact that there's one microphone up here, but I tend to like to have, uh, if they wish, to sort of, they're sort of in a conversation at a certain point to let that happen. But again, given the fact there's just one microphone, that may be a, uh, may be limited opportunities for that. Uh, they will then at the end will have a uh, three to four minutes for a summary statement that they'll present to you. Um, let's see, does anyone have a coin? Did you get a coin? Let's go ahead and flip one. I'm glad we didn't try to do this last night on Channel 13. We had, six, we had all six Democrats last night. So flipping a coin really wouldn't have worked. Charlie has one. Uh, here it goes. Lincoln is going to decide. The party of Lincoln. This is appropriate that a penny is our coin of choice. Dean, why don't you call it since it's Charlie's coin? Uh, Dean will then have a choice of whether he takes the first question first or whether or not he wants to take the closing statements first. Let's do it that way. All right. So you will be deciding whether you want to take closing statements first. Call it. Oh, I saw it. All right. Thank you. Very honest right away. You saw it. It is heads. Would you like to take the first question first or closing statements first? I'll take uh, closing statements. All right. Excellent. Uh, again, the questions prepared by the Cumberland County Committee. We're going to start with Charlie. You'll take the first question. We'll alternate who takes the first question. Each candidate will have a chance to answer each one of the questions. <coughs> Uh, again, I'm going to flip flop a little bit here in between some of the questions are sort of straight questions and some of the questions were written to sort of deliberately phrase them in a way that, that the committee believes the opposition would ask them. So please keep in mind as I ask the question, I'm phrasing them in the way that I was asked to phrase them. It's not me phrasing them. So let's begin with this. Uh, Charlie, first question. How can you Charlie Summers, justify spending billions of dollars on an illegal war in Iraq when the dollars could be better spent on health care for every man, woman, and child in America. You have three minutes to respond. Greg, thank you. Um, I think that the time for debating whether or not we should be in Iraq has long since passed. The fact of the matter is we are in Iraq, and we have to figure a way forward in Iraq. And I believe that there are three things that we need to do. First of all, Excuse me, the pollen is, seems to have gotten the better of me these days. First of all, I think we need to keep the troop levels just about where they are for the next 12 to 18 months. Because from my experience, being a soldier on the ground in Iraq, I've seen firsthand the progress that these troops have made under General Petraeus' leadership under the surge. I think it's important that we keep the troop levels where they are for the next 12 to 18 months so that our troops can continue to train the Iraqi security forces or the ISF as they're known. I think it's important from that point forward, once the Iraqi security forces are able to take control of the country, and keep in mind, they've already taken control of nine provinces, and the level of violence in Iraq is way, way down. And I can tell you from personal experience, from the time when I first arrived there to the time I left, the levels of attacks are way, way down. So we keep the troop levels 12 to 18 months just about where they are so they can train the security forces. Secondly, I think we have to redouble our diplomatic efforts. It's important that we expand the coalition that is currently working in Iraq to bring pre peace and stability to the Middle East. We bring in countries that did not want to 
come into the coalition in the first place. We have to bring France in. We have to bring the European countries in. Because make no mistake, what's it, what is it, has it, <coughs> excuse me, what's it at stake here is the survival of Western culture, the survival of the culture that you and I enjoy here in this United States, the survival of Western culture in, in the European Union as well. We need to bring more partners into this part, into this coalition. And thirdly, I think we need to employ another surge, a second surge, what I call a peace surge. We've won the war in Iraq. There's no question about that. I've seen that firsthand. What we need to do now, and what General Petraeus, when I was working on his staff, would always say, is we need to win the peace. And in order to win the peace, I think what we need to do is employ the provincial reconstruction teams. My job when I was in Iraq was working with provincial reconstruction teams. I traveled the country. I traveled to Fallujah, to Nazaria, to Garma, to Mosul, and all around that country. And I saw firsthand how the American troops and the coalition forces with the provincial reconstruction teams that consisted of agriculture experts, medical experts, economic experts, helping the Iraqis bring that social structure up so that they could get their country back on their feet because the Iraqis are actually no different than you and I. They want to be able to feed their families, have a safe and secure home, and they want to be able to run their business or have a job. It's that simple. It's that simple. And I think if we employ a peace surge and we get more ag experts and we get more medical experts so that we can have medical care for these folks, it will make a big difference and if we expand the coalition, we train the Iraqi security forces, and I believe that's a reasonable way forward on this. We can't accept defeat. We have to move forward. Thank you. Questions about the legality or the constitutionality of the, of, the, of the war in the first place. And secondly, how can you justify that cost in the face of the health care crisis we're currently facing? Um, I was glad to actually attend the, um, the plight of the Constitution debate back in uh, January, February with the rest of the Democrats. Because this is going to be a major strategy for them in the fall, which is to question the constitutionality of the war in the first place. And I stood up very boldly that night and, uh, and suggested, one, it was constitutional, but let's back up even before that. In 1998, while Bill Clinton was still in office, they passed on the floor of the House and the Senate regime change in Iraq. So I don't want to hear all this stuff about administration changes. They're on the record of, of supporting regime change in Iraq based upon the same information that we had four or five years later to go into Iraq. So let's take our partisan hats off about this for a second. Second of all, if you want to get into the constitutionality of the war, we actually haven't declared war as a country since World War II. That's not what we did. We asked for permission and essentially an open checkbook to go into Iraq. That's legal. And what I told the Democrats there that night, I'll tell you again, because I've actually studied this book to make sure I hold it up the right way. I had to take constitutional law twice to get through it. But it's a very important document. They're going to be coming at us about this document which was the executive owns the, uh, owns the authority to, to ask the Congress for war. That, if it were to be illegal, would have gone before the Constitution, or would have gone before the Supreme Court. That is our balance of powers. And just because you don't like the outcome doesn't mean that it's any more illegal or Ill unconstitutional. The fact is the Constitution worked. And it may have not been to your political liking, or mine for that matter, but you can't pick and choose the parts of the Constitution you like and the parts of the Constitution you don't like. That being said, when you look at our health care costs, right? As I've said before, this country is $34 trillion in the hole. And why? Because of our entitlement spending, our mandatory spending, largely comprised of Medicare and Medicaid. And I've heard Shelley and Ethan and Mike and put them all in the same group talk about expanding the universal health care, expanding SCHIP. And what does that do? That puts pressure on that mandatory spending um, a march we're already on to collapse even sooner. So when you ask me, one, I'll say it's constitutional. And secondly, I will tell you, you can't put a price on freedom. Thank you very much.